Pirates of the Caribbean, it's, it's got to honestly be one of the most unexpected hit franchises from any studio, like, let alone Disney. I mean, just imagine being the marketing guy that walked in one day, confidence, courage boosted up, you're ready, and you walk in there and say, all right, guys, look, just hear me out and bear with me here. Just bear with me. What if we took that Pirates of the Caribbean theme ride we have and we made it into a movie? And I can just imagine this because everyone's probably laughing their asses off right at the guy. And who's laughing now? I mean, <laughs> these three films made $2.7 billion at the box office revenue. So I know that guy's probably pretty damn happy about it. Pirates of the Caribbean, I mean, I don't think I even have to speak for all the massive attention that it's already gotten throughout these years. I think, honestly, even person between like Harry Potter, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Matrix, even Godfather, like all those movies, I feel like Pirates of the Caribbean is one of those unanimously I've at least seen one type of films. Like everyone I feel like I've talked to at one point has seen at least one of these films. Directed by Gore Vinsky and starring one of the biggest ensemble casts, honestly, in film franchises as well with Johnny Depp, Kiara Knightley, Orlando Bloom. Bill Nye, Jeffrey Rush, Tom Hollander, it's, it's, it's quite the lineup we've got here. The way I'm probably going to go about this review for these three films, that, because it is a trilogy, it is a trilogy, is I'm just going to go ahead and break it up into the one, two, and three respectively and go in order for that, it's just so, you know, ease of transition. And just starting right off the bat, so Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl came out in 2003, that's right, already 17 years ago, guys, shit is crazy. Curse of the Black Pearl is arguably one of the finer 2000s epic fantasy adventure films. And the main two highlights of this film that always really stuck out to me is the story and the characters. So the story, which is incredibly fleshed out, it's the, the more we receive information in regards to a character's background, the plot itself unravels to us, we slowly but surely also begin to see the main character's motivations begin to change. And in Hinge, we see some changes of hearts, irrational and rational decision making from the characters, and it's all because of a well-written screenplay. And some of the character changes even from this first film alone are pretty drastic, say from Will becoming this hardcore anti-piracy blacksmith that turns into a hero of damsels in distress, to Elizabeth going from a respected governor's daughter into Hollywood's most wanted, to, you know, Barbosa's treacherous mutiny that made him captain of the Black Pearl, even, but despite of all that, just caused a massive amount of consequences for him and his crew. It's like, all in all, these characters have this supplemental development and likability to them. Even the villain, Hector Barbosa, which, I don't know, I personally love the fact that they gave him the first name of Hector because I can always just love when Jack Sparrow or someone calls him by Hector and just kind of gives him all credibility loss. It's like, Hector's trying to steal the Black Pearl, look at Hector. <laughs> but of course you have the star of the film that really brought light to the film and that's Jack Sparrow. And it's, it's, I can just imagine Johnny Depp, you know, creating this immersive role, but I can just see him going up to the character design and costume design team and him just coming up and saying, so guys, I know how pirates are supposed to look and I know this is how you guys are going for it as well, but do you think my character could have, you know, some black eyeliner, putting some dreads on him as well? The costume team was probably looking at each other like, what is he talking about? Like I said though, the writing, screenplay, actors, as well as the whole energy of the film really just mesh and work together to create this bombastic action spectacle. You've got production set pieces that still look timeless 17 years later. It flawlessly just immerses you into this pirate world and this time period of piracy and lawlessness. And every time they show you Tortuga, I personally love that city just because Everyone is just an absolute mess in the city. Everyone's either drinking or fighting or even doing both at the same damn time. The sword fighting sequences are shot so well too, even though 90% of the stuff that you see, like especially within this film, it probably would have ended within 10 to 15 seconds of actual fighting. I mean, you've got Jack and Will on these wooden beams, one foot over the other, still trying to just maintain balance, composure, adequate fighting style. It's like, I don't care if you're Batman, my guy. It's like, I know you're not trying to do all this like while still having composure and everything ready. A few gripes with the film, though, for me, despite all the positives I've mentioned, is one of them is pacing, and that there are a handful of times where a scene is just carrying on a little bit too long. It's dragging away some of the tension that, that the film is trying to build up. Some characters like Norentine are underutilized and that, you know, while we do get more of him in Dead Man's Chest and that's perfectly fine, I'd say that his role in this film should have been set up higher so that way we can experience and kind of feel more of his turmoil for the sequel that follows up. By far the biggest issue that I have with the Black Pearl though is that and this is a bigger issue in the following movies, which are all addressed, but even in this film, the comedic relief is, it kind of disarrays the tone a lot. 
And what I mean by that is there's a lot of scenes where something's building up, something's escalating, you know, there's an eerie scene occurring, you don't know what's going on, so it's kind of unpleasant and uncomfortable. But then immediately afterwards, they hit you with a joke, they hit you with something that happens funny on screen, and while it's not as bad and as frequent here, I still say there's a lot of scenes that are pretty dark here that they could have acclimated to something bigger, but they won't because they want to show a monkey doing something stupid. And next we have Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest. Came out in 2006, a long time ago as well, and I might be in the small minority on this one, but I think the sequel is pretty much on par with the first film. You know, some people say it's a little too long, or some story elements don't make that much sense, or could have been executed better, and sure, I agree with that. Some, some, some sections of the film could have been executed better, especially for me with the first act. It kind of dragged on some places, you know, trying to find and rescue Jai, it could have been shortened or done a little bit better, or some scenes where I'm like, eh, whatever, you know, time passes by. For the most part, though, this is a proper sequel to our first exploration of these characters. You know, this movie did exactly what a great sequel should do in that it expanded the enormous lore of the Caribbean. We're introduced to a handful of new characters that really add on to the overarching story, including William's deadbeat dad, uh, the infamous Davy Jones in the flesh, and the Christopher Columbus of the franchise, Lord Cutler Beckett. And we still have the same sort of exuberant imagery, sound score, humor, and battles that made the first one so great. It seems like the writer and director were pretty much on the same page of how to continue the story by simply adding a larger production value to its use. And some quick pros for me would be the special effects team who made Davy Jones and his crew look incredibly fearsome and grotesque looking fish people at all times. The entirety of the third act on the beach and everyone scrambling for the chest is so chaotic, funny, and possibly ridiculous because when they're doing that spin, that cartwheel battle, whatever, between Norrington, Will, and Jack, it's, it's over the top, but at the same time, I can't help it. It's really good. It makes it a fun, fun action sequence. And they're able to manage all this with a proper balance of wit, anxiety, care for camera shooting to make you feel like you're really right there with them on the beach just witnessing this catastrophic. The Kraken, I'd say, is one of the most extraordinary creature designs next to others like Godzilla or even maybe the Xenonorse from the Alien franchise in that its presence and its unstoppable power are truly measured nicely here. From when we first witnessed the Kraken taking the bow in a few seconds to those two villagers or pillagers, whatever they're doing in the middle of the sea, to the final standoff against the Pearl and Jack Sparrow, you know the Kraken can just absolutely fuck shit up. And again, a few cons nonetheless for Dead Man's Chest for me is just the inconsistency in establishing some certain scenes that could have benefited to going that further into greater heights and not resorting to humor. Compared to The Curse of the Black Pearl, there's way too many times in this one where the tone just bounces back and forth, back and forth, and just really loses steam and intensity. Just play the scene out and let it go how it should be. You don't need to make us as a viewer laugh just because something bad happens. And lastly on Dead Men's Chest, I, I love how it ends. It's not a victory. It's not successful. We lose our favorite and our best character. The team acknowledges defeat and it seems like all hope is lost. And then boom, comes in Barbosa of all people in the final frames of this shot. And I gotta tell you, I remember when I was 10, I saw that in theaters and everything. That was one of the best theater moments of all time. As soon as you hear the footsteps coming down, his face reveal, everyone's like, no way. Like, you feel me? It's just like one of the best reveals of all time. And finally, to wrap up this trilogy review comes Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. And this, this is where things start to go very wrong. Whereas Dead Man's Chest, you know, you had just about the right amount of new material and everything. This film just gives us way too much. And look, I don't mean even to my own horn or anything, but I'm smart enough, you know, like I had straight A's throughout school and college, but good Lord, if any of you can actually tell me what the plot of this film is correctly, I would give you the highest praise. Some people say Dead Man's Chest is convoluted. It's like, no. This is the meaning of the word convoluted. Nothing makes sense, and everything is raised to a bar that's just too high. The supernatural factor of At World's End is just so high. The stakes are ridiculously huge. The characters are unfocused and don't really have time for growth. They feel stagnant and forced sometimes. It's all a mess, but the biggest issue with the film is that we as a viewer just don't know what's going on from the character's perspective because everyone's just changing their motivations. Jack switches sides probably every 15 minutes. Elizabeth is struggling to become a, this female pirate lord. Will can't speak up for, <laughs> he just can't speak up, can't open his mouth to what he wants to do. And above all else, what the fuck is going on with Davy Jones and Calypso? I still cannot 100% comprehend what her attentions are for him. 
And I still can't understand what Davy Jones really wants to do besides trying to win Calypso back, I guess. I don't know, everyone just keeps changing gears. It's a mess structurally, and it takes away from the simplicities of the first two films. And I'm not done yet either. There's so much that feels utterly wasted in this film, and it's especially seen in that last final battle. The whole time there's this uncertainty and intriguing setup for Calypso, sure, but once that all happens and Calypso or her goddess form is released into the sky or whatever, you know, she, de she dematerializes into the crabs and returns into her natural form, if, if that's what you want to call it, I don't even know. And then right afterwards, I just hate how the final sequence goes down. After a whole sit down and informal business meeting between the nine pirate lords, literally all they do at the end is celebrate because the P Black Pearl wins. I mean, you guys have a whole army model to deal with but you guys are celebrating I get like what happens and everything but at the same time the fact that we don't see them fight or do anything all of these introductions I could just I can just imagine the reason being is because they probably used up 90% of their 300 million budget on everything else they're two and a half hours deep into the film and some the directors probably looking up like all right guys we have hundred dollars left we're not shooting this we'll give you your paychecks here you go nonetheless there there's some enjoyable aspects to the film of course at world's end still features some insane fights there's still brilliant special effects through and through and ultimately it still gives us a conclusion that feels probably fell you know elizabeth and will get together at the end jack gets what he wants everyone just basically just you know gets in the right place in the right state of mind the pirates finally get their rightfully deserved win and life goes on so, as a trilogy, Pirates of the Caribbean, it works, for the most part. It establishes this incredible world, it introduces us to now some very familiar faces, it revamped and brought back the swashbuckler subgenre, and if you didn't know, because I didn't even know prior to making this video, but swashbuckler is a real world, so there you go, fun fact of the day. The first two films are especially entertaining, and the final piece is just, you know, it's like a firework that tries to go up without the actual big bang boom. Nothing really happens, and we're left to like, you know, a little disappointed, but all in all, it's still a great trilogy. Also, a final little nod that I just wanted to give for this trilogy, dude, is shout out to the actors who play Pintel and Rigetti. I don't think they necessarily, you know, get that much credit, but if you know your American literature, uh, they really reminded me of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, who, if you don't know, they're side characters who don't really get that much screen time but comparatively to the other characters and they always come out and they always play this dumb and dumber role to the best of their capabilities and i feel like they don't get mentioned around that much within the trilogy purposes but like i said shout out to them for always just making these char characters consistent and just enjoying their time while at it with everything said i give curse of the black pearl a eight Dead Man's Chest, a seven and a half, and At World's End, it's, it's just gotta be a flat fiver. Which, if I rounded all of it up, and I will, because I read it just round up for the sake of the sake of purpose, and I just enjoy the trilogy, it still gives Pirates of the Caribbean, the one, two, three, a solid seven. Also, if you made it this far into the review, then thank you, first and foremost, hope you enjoyed, hope you keep watching, but I know you're curious that, you know, why did I snub on Stranger Tides, and why am I not talking about Dead Man Tell No Tales, and just gonna close the review by saying, um, yeah, we don't talk about trash.